sequence start in five, four, three, two, one. This is Out of Bounds, two guys talking sports and astrology. You're listening to Wayne Moody and Mark Lerner. Welcome, everybody, for a new Out of Bounds, Two Guys Talking Sports and Astrology. Myself, Mark Lerner, with Wayne Moody. How you doing, Wayne? How's it going? I'm doing great, Mark. Okay, terrific. Great to hear your voice. And this is going to be part of our GPS Astrology magazine, not just astrology, but all kinds of cool subjects for everybody out there. It's our fifth issue. All of these are available. Uh, at, at greatbearenterprises.com, www.greatbearenterprises.com on the top. You'll see GPS Astrology. You can go through all the four previous issues. Brother Wayne's got his articles in there. I've got my stuff. Um, Brother Wayne has all kinds of things he's been doing for decades on astrocartography, and we've got several pages in every issue on astrocartography so that you'll get familiar with that. So today... We've got three main topics relating to sports and whatever else we're going to share. So uh, just to mention it real briefly, introducing the clock for for pitchers and batters in baseball, which is really fascinating. And we're going to look at that first for about a quarter of an hour. And then this whole crazy thing going on with golf and Saudi Arabia, power and oil and apparently a merging of the PGA in America with this other organization called the, I guess it's called LIV. I don't even know what that stands for, quite frankly, but um, coming through with money and golfers and so on. And there have been a lot of unfortunate, I, I don't know if I want to call it mysterious, but deaths of horses, particularly with the three main races, you know, the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness and the Belmont Stakes. And, um, really unnerving kinds of things and a lot of accusations and a lot of investigations that need to go on. And we want to take a look at that. So um, I know that you are more from your sports heritage, part of the football universe than the baseball. (laughs) Nevertheless, we are both lovers of sports and involved with it. And it pains me. And I understand why that major league baseball after COVID or during COVID started doing things like, oh, let's make the game seven innings and, you know, getting all the different owners and everybody to agree to these kind of things. And then changes with how we videotape everything and that things like you and I have already talked about, you know, whether it's football or soccer or basketball, different sports, including baseball, where suddenly umpires and referees, like everybody's waiting for, you know, New York or someplace to verify, you know, did they go over the was it really a touchdown? Was it out of bounds? And now, you know, was it a home run or not? And now we've got, and I don't know if I remember all of this, but apparently every pitcher, right, once you get the ball back from a catcher, it's like, and and it's not just like 15 seconds, they can see it, right? It's on the electronic thing as they're looking in to home plate, at least the way I see it when I've looked a couple of games, 15, 14, 13, you know what I mean? Clock going down. And I think the batter has, like, once they sort of enter the batter's box, they're also under a timing thing. Uh, Maybe it's 20 seconds or 21. So everybody's sort of on, you know, this is the game that never had a clock. So what do you think about them introducing this? You know, I know that there's power and money, and they want to make games shorter. But it seems like pitchers are now having a lot of problems with their deliveries. Scores are becoming, like the other day, the Los Angeles Angels, I sent you a text, were up 24 to nothing against the Colorado Rockies in Colorado halfway through the game. I was like, what is going on? 24. They, there were more runs that the Angels got in that game than they've ever gotten. And that's a lot of runs. And I, it looked like a football score. And it was a baseball score. What do you think? Well, Mark. Here's a quote. You probably heard it before. Warren, I guess his name is pronounced Span. Okay. He said, hitting is timing and pitching is upsetting timing. 
And so here we are fundamentally changing the game for both the hitters and the pitchers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've, I've, we've had this conversation off the record about all the tampering that owners and coaches do with the game. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's, 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 in, it's for me, Sports in America and the rules set in sports in America is like the ascendant of the United States, which is sad for us that use 447 p.m. or yeah. even those who use the four, you know, the different times, the five o'clock p.m. Right. It's still a Sagittarian cook uh, chart. And so it, it's changing rules in sports is as fundamental as changing the rules in government. Yeah. You know, it there's somebody's ox is going to get gored and somebody has calculated that that is an improvement. Yeah. Well, um, who knows about whether it's an improvement or not, but the last two professional baseball games that I attended, I remember them vividly because of how exciting and well done they were. Both of them were involving the, uh, the, the San Francisco Giants. And yeah. one of them was in the 80s, and the other was in 2016. So there's a great deal of time between the times that I'd seen uh, baseball games played, 30 years. But mm-hmm. what I remember is the, the game that I saw with the Giants and the Yankees here in uh, California uh, was in the era of Daryl Strawberry. Right. And I marveled at how beautiful the game looked. Yeah. The game, the game was the clockwork of it. Speaking yeah. of time, the clockwork beauty of the game was yeah. just. It was like it was like watching a dance rehearsal, you or, know, or the la- or the lack of clockwork. In other words, it has its own inherent time outside yes. of the clock time, which is the beauty of the game, right? Yes, historically. Yes. And so here they are. They want to manipulate that because, you know, who knows? I mean, I, I'm not into the nuances of why they made the decision, whether, right. uh, you know, it was entirely about money, entirely about COVID. Uh, it had to do with, well, if we tweak this, we're going to get a better performance here. It'll be a pitcher's game or it'll be a fielder's game or it'll be a batter's game. Well, what, for the last decade, it's pretty much been a, a hitter's game, hasn't it? Most of the time, you know, yeah, absolutely, because they made the designated hitter in the American League. I think they were supposed to have the National League join, which they never wanted to. The National League, which started the whole baseball thing back in 1876 with Cincinnati, the American League didn't start till I think, it was 1901. You know, so the National League has always tried to stay in sync with the history, right, with the spirit of the game. And the American League was like, wait, we're, they added more teams than the National League, and then they added the designated hit. Everything was about scoring runs. So is this, are these new timing rules in both leagues? That I don't know. You know, I, and I regret to everyone out there that, and I'll just be honest, because I've been honest with you the last couple of months since the last time, Putting in the clock has made me not want to watch a game. I'm just being honest with everybody, and I love baseball. And it's not just that I come from New York and the Yankees and the Mets and the Dodgers and Giants back in the 50s. We had amazing teams, you know. But it's like how much – and it's like – and you and I joke around. It's like George Carlin, you know, the whole difference between football and baseball. And baseball, the goal is to go home. To go home, you know, <laughs> the whole thing in football is like the field general throwing the bomb, you know what I mean, marching his troops down, you know, and, you know, for a comedian to capture that historical, you know, comic rendition, but now that spirit and the beauty and all that laughter, it's so true. And, you know, one thing I hadn't realized, I'll just mention again uh, to you and then for your comment, America, America's national past time. Isn't it interesting that the phrase has been our past past time, time. with time meaning it's a way of passing time. 
what we don't want is to be on a clock. I mean, right. can you imagine it's like sudden death? You know, it's like, I mean, what will be the next thing in a year or two when they review these rules and they decide, okay, we've got the clock 15 seconds. What are they going to do in the World Series? You know, it's like, okay, we don't want the games going too long in the series. We've got to make enough money, right? We, we've, what was the, the last thing we were talking about, I think, in a previous Out of Bounds, or one of the last two, was about money. All this money, right, that's being – with gambling. I think that was one of our themes, right? We were talking about all the betting going on. And, you know, Pete Rose, and we did Pete Rose's chart. He's born on the day of a Pluto station, turned, just turned 82 years old. You know, Neptune going opposite is Neptune, about to have Uranus return. They're betting all over the place. We covered this the last time, right? And yet, and, and you know, oh, let's bet on football. Let's bet on baseball. Meanwhile, he's still ostracized. He's not going in the Hall of Fame. You know, to let him do that, but they'll make all this money from betting. This, you know, this doesn't sound right. And the same okay. thing with the clock here. Yeah. Do you think that they literally um, uh, averaged the amount of pitches and the amount of um, swings at bat for each mm-hmm. game, and then said, if we limit right. the amount time, then we can control the length of the game. Do you think they did that calculation? Well, I think somebody did. You know, now, I don't know. Remember, there was a Moneyball. Uh, that was a movie Brad Pitt starred in it, but it was based on the general manager. Uh, I forget his name now, but he was with Oakland. And then he eventually, yes. I think he may be with the Mets now. And so the whole thing was like, let's calculate all the stuff. And they started drafting players. Um, and then there was another movie with Kevin Costner, who's been in a lot of baseball stuff, Field of Dreams, um, and some other movies, because he's been into baseball his, his whole life, or sports. But the thing is, between Moneyball, it's been for a d- couple of decades now, and you know, you know football backwards and forwards a lot more than I do with all of that stuff, and all of these salaries that are just like beyond anything you can imagine. So I would say, yes, that was part of this thing. But I guess, I guess you know, and we're going to move on to some other topics, but I want to get your take on another thing here. So whatever statistical stuff, you know, because baseball is the beginning of all these statistical things. You know, remember, like, with football, and you would have a whole history more than I do. It's not like in the old days. I mean, there weren't, wasn't a whole lot of passing. The whole idea of the forward pass had to be introduced, right, at a certain point, what, in, like, the yeah, 1930s right. and 40s. But it was a grinding out game. And when in Europe, we see rugby and we see these games. Every time yeah. I turn on – the other day, I, I turned on something because I didn't want to watch baseball. And I'm watching rugby, which they're calling football. It's in Australia. And I can't believe how the, the game is operating. It's like all these people, one team, are all hunched together, like all like a group stole, right, pushing this, you know, ball and moving it around. And it's all very sort of like – strange and it's grinding out all of this stuff and they're all in the kind of mud and all these different things so it's very much an earthy kind of thing you know what i mean grinding out and moving this football around and the other thing that's interesting is because like in football it's not called uh <laughs> pass ball it's foot it's your foot right it's running yes. with the ball you know like jim brown who just passed away you know probably the greatest running back ever because he was a full, full back. You know, even now, that term is like disappeared in football. It's like running back. Every, and so that's the thing with the clock. It's like, you know, they don't care about people like me and you with these sports, that we understand the history. But, again, I know that I'm talking and you are talking for people of our epoch and our age. This is a very sad thing that pitchers, and, again, I think it messes people up, like a Sandy Koufax who was very wild with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and I know his record. He, you know, one year he was like 6 and 14. He had to be trained how to throw the damn ball over the plate, and he finally got it together in Los Angeles. And then for three years, he was unbelievable with all these no-hitters, and people basically couldn't hit him. And then he retired. He was like 31. You know, it was like, what? <laughs> he didn't want to burn his arm out. You know what I mean? And yeah. 
he, he and Don Drysdale were these two players. You know, this, we were going to talk about um, Kurt Flood at one point. Maybe we will about who, you know, that a player shouldn't feel owned by a team, which goes back to all the issues of slavery and Native Americans and other things. And in baseball, that's the way it always was. And so we'll probably get into that topic another time because that's still an important story. But Don Drysdale and um, and um, Sandy Koufax with the Dodgers, they were doing really well, and they were trying to hold out. This was the, it was kind of funny because in the old days, uh, they both showed up on the Donna Reed show, believe it or not, because this is the 50s, and the Brooklyn Dodgers had just gone to Los Angeles. And so people like Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris and Willie Mays, they were all showing up on these shows like Ozzy and Harriet, you know, Donna Reed, Father Knows Best, whatever it is all these superstars of baseball and, you know, sports. But at any rate, they tried to say, hey, we're too important for the Dodgers, Drysdale and, and uh, Koufax, so we'll hold out for more money. They wanted more money, and the Dodgers wouldn't give it to them. So they wound up going back, kind of tail between their legs. I think eventually they got a little bit more. But, they, you know, in those days, it was he was still tied to a team. So I think this whole thing is like the modern thing, the, the the Mark Learners and the Wayne Moody's they're going they're going to be going away pretty soon. We want to control the game, right? This is our thing, and the pitchers and the batters and the teams just have to get used to it. Well, you know they say what they're trying to change is the batting average. Uh, uh-huh. They say league wide the batting average was down to the batting average was down yeah. to two four three. Wow. And it's, that was the lowest since 1968. That, mm. That's a surprise. And yeah. then they said, so I imagine that they said that particularly what was lacking was um, um, singles. <laughs> so that's so a, in other words, the, the batters... Yeah. We're sitting on the ball waiting for a good right. pitch. Right. Yeah, so they were wasting time according to the statisticians. You right. Know, looking for getting a walk. Well, again, this is part of baseball, but it's the Right, right, right. right. The book, yeah. right. And, Mark, and Mark, that gets to the, okay, wasting time. Well, isn't time of freedom? Wasn't it a generous right. kind of thing? Wasn't it like air in the past? And now you want to control that too? What could yeah. be the, possibly the next thing that they change? Because well, when you're changing the time, you're making yeah. the the batter change his habits. Yeah. That maybe he had a whole career developed about how yeah. he would go and approach the the base, the, the you know, yeah. have the base and do his little ritual, do his little dance, tap the ball back up a couple of times. <laughs> right. No, no, you know, and it's affecting the managers. Um, I watched this whole thing, Say Hey Willie Mays on HBO. They had never done a whole special on him. They had done Mickey Mantle and other people a long time ago. And I learned something that was really fascinating. By the way, folks, Say Hey Willie Mays, HBO, two hours, incredible history of Willie Mays, the New York Giants and the San Francisco Giants, and the city of San Francisco and its issues having to do with race relations. Very fascinating. And what happened was is that I heard something that, I never understood because, you know, the catcher looks to the manager, you know, to get get signals to give to the pitcher. You know what I mean? Fundamentally, the catcher and, you know, I feel grateful I did a baseball tarot, which is almost out of print. I only have a few copies left, folks, with Laura Phillips at Great Parent Enterprise. If you want to get into a baseball tarot deck, we've got about seven copies left. But the thing is, is that, you know, like watching the Yankees, be like Yogi Bear. A lot of catchers become managers because they're the ones on the field. They look to them, you know, to the to the um, the dugout, right? And they're giving getting signs, and then the catcher gives those signs under, like you know, w- w- before you know where the umpire is in front of the batter, and gives those to the pitcher, and then the other players can kind of see, you know, whatever the numbers are and whatever the catcher is doing. But it turns out Willie Mays said that he was actually not the catcher. He was in control on the field. He had an agreement with the manager because Willie Mays was so amazing that w- everyone looked at Willie. And he and Willie said in this show 
that every single play he was directing as he played center field, the left fielder and the right fielder, and like, you know, the shortstops and other people would sort of look out to Willie and Willie might That's make pretty, some kind of gesture. That's and pretty, that controlled the play. And Willie said one other thing. And if they didn't do what he did, they would not play the next day. That's how much power Willie Mays had as an on-field, you know, kind of almost like catcher giving out signals. Sure. Yeah. And what you just said, if you have a clock, right, then everybody is like in this hurried, tense yes. mood. Yeah. And, and you that's know, the last thing you want in baseball. And they said, you know, uh, and it, apparently the clock has had a, a significant impact on the shortstop. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I'm trying to imagine that because I never played any positions in baseball, and I'm trying to see – so what would make the shortstop so much different than the other players and so sensitive to the timing yeah. of the pitch and the timing of the batter in the box? Right. Well, well, somehow, as best as I can explain it, everything gets divided in the following way. you got the manager, right, with the catcher sort of going back and forth. Almost every pitch, what, am I, what, what what's the pitcher going to throw? Fastball, curve, you know, whatever, brush back, whatever is it. And if the timing is 15 seconds, right, they're all tense. The shortstop is sort of like the controller of the four infielders, first, second, and third. So the shortstop, you know, is in, it's not at a base. So they're kind of somewhat in charge of the other three fielders to some extent. And the thing about Willie Mays is just like blows my mind that there was this one guy because he was so superlative at everything, probably, you know, I mean, I would agree as much as I love Mickey Mantle and Babe Ruth and Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams and all these different people. But as a complete player, nobody was ever as great as Willie Mays on all levels. You know what I mean? There's just a certain phenomenal quality. So that was an eye opener for me. Um, We should probably go on to the other one. Yeah, one thing before we go on, Mark. Um, Go ahead. The fact that we now have transiting Saturn in Pisces, squaring the U.S. ascendant, and there are these issues of timing right. uh, and the control of timing, like what the uh, the House of Representatives did a couple of weeks ago uh, before, um, you know, the, the, news, the news cycle passed them by, is they refused to go in and handle certain urgent bills Right, and yeah, and then you and then he, so so I'm 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 seeing it this way. I'm seeing it, you know, baseball is the American pastime, pastime, and baseball, the American pastime, has had rules changes in timing, and right. it's been really awkward and it hasn't gone over well. It's causing all kinds of problems. It's not a trying, it's a square. <laughs> Well, well, and, and one other little point in all this is uh, I'm glad you brought this up because we are presenting a solstice chart for which just happened June 21 based in Washington, D.C. When when you all look at this and hear this in GPS, and it'll also be um, at the Mark Lerner Astrology Tarot section on YouTube. So it plays there also. We're going to put these charts out. Katja, uh, my daughter, Katja Lerner, will put these charts. So we have the solstice chart, which I might mention that just happened, very powerful for Washington, D.C., and two progressions of the U.S. chart from July 4th, 1776, that Brother Wayne is bringing up about Saturn. So to, um, these charts are for today, and I didn't say that, you know, in the beginning, but this is June 28th of 2023. It's a Wednesday. And by the way, when we started, Jupiter was setting in the sign Taurus, Scorpio was rising, and there's a lot of auspicious alignments today in the sky, what we call transits. And hopefully in the next thing about golf, we'll talk a little bit about Mars, what's called the solar arc progressed Mars for the United States, which we did mention back on January 1 being on top of our moon, Pallas Athena, and this other planet called Quayor at 27 of Aquarius in the U.S. chart from the Declaration of Independence. So we've got some charts in here, okay, that I wanted to refer to. And thank you for bringing up Saturn because what Brother Wayne was just saying, the chart we've used, Woken Planet Earth, and just in our own work together um, for 40 years has a Sagittarius rising for the U.S. 
uh, of about seven plus of Sagittarius, and, and Saturn just squared that. The other point is that we have Ceres, the largest asteroid for the U.S., stationary at eight of Pisces, and our Uranus is setting, okay, at seven plus of Gemini, or eight plus of Gemini, excuse me. So the Saturn, as you just said, which rules time in general, chronological time, the square that Brother Wayne is talking about is to our horizon of our higher self-expression as a country and how we relate to others. And since the you know, baseball is the national pastime. For us to bring this up at this point with the Saturn, and as you pointed out, makes total sense. You know what I mean? This is not, we're bringing this up, folks, because whoever you are, if you love baseball, how many of you who love baseball and all sports, right, want to see this happening? I mean, <laughs> it's almost like they've changed these rules and we're all being dragged, kicking and screaming into this new, methodology all because of shortening games or the power of major league baseball you know to fit things into schedules and so on and it just seems like a travesty but thank you for bringing that up and that way you know i've i've corrected the fact or I've, uh, people know that we're on june 28th that's when we're doing this in late afternoon uh, pacific time let me just bring up the golf thing for a moment we can talk about this yep. for 10 or 15 minutes so as many of you know, now I, I love golf, okay, or I did. And as a young kid, I learned it. My parents were country club people. That was part of their fortunate thing back in the East Coast. They loved playing golf and other things. I learned how to play. I got to be very good at it. Even when I got to Michigan State where I went to school, I I didn't stay with it, but, you know, I wanted to be on the golf team. And I've watched golf, even though, like, you know, golf, you can fall asleep watching. But the thing about golf is that you're sort of playing against yourself you know, in many ways. I mean, of course, they have PGA, U.S. Open, all these different tournaments in America and around the world. But for those of you who haven't followed, suddenly out of nowhere in the last about two years or so, Greg Norman, we might get into him in a little bit from Australia, who had always had, he, he won a number of British Opens, and he lost uh, very weirdly in the Masters and the U.S. Open on the last day twice. And we know his chart. And I know it pretty well because he has sun opposite Saturn. He became in charge of this group connected to Saudi Arabia. And the whole thing was to pay golfers, particularly, you know, America and in Europe, money to sort of get off of what's called the Professional Golf Association. And uh, Tiger Woods and uh, Rory McIlroy from Ireland, I hope I'm remembering that correctly. I'm pretty sure he's Irish. They were particularly re resistant to this thing, and the whole this created this conflict. Okay, I'm just giving everybody a little bit of background. And then just recently, somehow, out of nowhere, and to a surprise of everybody, even with the former president Donald Trump saying, "Oh, this is a great thing," you know, join up with the Saudi Arabian-backed, you know, strange group that Greg Norman was sort of championing. What happened was in the last year, they started doing tournaments, paying these different people lots of money, and it created this whole split between kind of the – this is, again, like baseball with the clock, right? This traditional slow game, right, part of nature, you know, leisurely, you know, part of Mother Nature, the contours of each course, you know, where is the wind blowing? Take your time, yes, you know, okay. to understand the dynamics, the beauty of nature – this, all these different people like the Jack Nicholas's and Tiger Woods and Arnold Palmer's, you know, creating courses based on, you know, their experience, what they're following. And then suddenly it's all money and power now. You know, Saudi Arabia, oil, and they apparently have united. Okay, so that's the story. So where, where are your feelings on that? And look, I have a lot of anger and frustration from one standpoint without bringing in everything, but I want to have, have your take. Supposedly... 17 of the 19 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. And Osama bin Laden was, was born in Saudi Arabia, even though he was at odds with the Saudi Arabian government and all, that whole history. And we just have kept up as America, our connection with oil and Saudi Arabia because they're against Iran and so on. So talk about money, talk about politics, talk about oil. We can't, you know, this is a short segment. But this is what stresses me out. Again, geopolitics, money and power entering a sports world where it shouldn't really be, in my opinion. Your take. Mark, 
the athletes who are who are on the field, the ones who are doing what everybody admires, they're not the policymakers. Who you? I mean, Norman, of course, he's he's agreed yeah. to jump ship and and grab a bunch of guys and go yeah. unite with the Saudis and if apparently money's at the root of all this. But when I look at the the international games that are played with sports, like mm-hmm. banning some countries' Olympics or doing all of that kind of stuff, it makes me think back to Jesse Owens and right. Joe Luke, the Brown Bomber, both of right. them competing at high levels against uh, German um, uh, athletes yep. and, and becoming their best friends. I mean, it's it's not about the players. They're, it's almost like these magnificent sportsmen are pawns in a system, syst- in a system that is using sports to right. other ends, and not right. necessarily just for the pure enjoyment and the recreation of its citizens. They're using it to make a point. And mm-hmm. here we have, you know, again Saturn. And you know the the other uh, uh, bodies that you just mentioned uh, squaring the U.S. ascendant, and here now it's not just the sport of baseball. Now we're looking at the sport of golf, which I'm not a golfer, you know, I, not at all. But for some reason, uh, I've been boycotting. Not comp- particularly um, clear as to why 100%, but I've been doing that. Uh, just like when Sammy Davis Jr. hugged Richard Nixon, and then he got boycotted. Wait, wait, Sammy don't re- don't remind me, my friend. But you just planted that picture, and I can see it as clear as day. But go ahead, go ahead. I can clear, so, clearly clearly so, see that moment. So it was pure <laughs> prejudice on my part that I, I stopped watching golf because I used to enjoy yeah. watching it, and especially yeah. when Tiger Woods was on his ascent. Uh, but you yeah. know, I I like watching sportsmen who have a good story behind their abilities to participate in sports. It's and, and it's a teaching moment for Americans. You know, America has well, I imagine other countries too, but in this culture, since this is the one I grew up in, they athletes were expected to be role models, whether right. they wanted to or not, whether they were or not. There was a there was a PR uh, push to make them look like better human beings than they actually were. And some of these athletes actually were good human beings. So it wasn't anything that needed to be contrived. But I'm looking at this whole thing that's playing out with the golf, and it's like, how many villains do you have? (laughs) Well, well, you know, Brother Wayne, here's the other thing. You know, and I've watched this. um, I did an article on Brittany Griner. uh, and her plight going over to Russia and then getting seized. You know, now they've got a Wall Street Journal guy. You know what I mean? We've got the thing that just occurred in the last week, you know, Prigozhin, which is another whole story. You know, and maybe we'll we'll do something. I, I have a short thing I want to do, a little podcast in a couple of days on the Prigozhin thing. But what I wanted to bring up was women have been trying to get equal amounts of money in all their sports. You know what I mean? We don't have, you know, uh, an NFL for women, but there is the Women's National Basketball, you know, association. We've got women, particularly doing. Mark, may I interject something? Which, if you watch the games this year, they are tremendous. Go ahead. Well, yeah, my, my point in all this is like, would okay, let's choose. Um. Magic Johnson or someone like that going to Russia, would they have seized him? Of course not. You know what I mean? And put him under arrest. What she had to go through, Brittany Griner, right? Um, because they found what, you know, a joint, this or that, she forgot to take out of it. Come on. You know what I'm saying? So there are certain people, and this gets back to the men and women thing. I have not heard, and this, this could be my own fault, anything about women golfers with this whole thing. It's been all no. men. It's been no, all power. Yeah. And it's like Donald Trump saying, I think it's a good thing, you know, that, you know, all for more money and so on. You know, <laughs> this is the same person. 
who has all, without getting into anything that people are going to, you know, yell at me for, is like, with all these national documents, and as many of you know, I've, you know, Brother Wayne and I are both focused on nuclear issues and mundane earth world astrology and concerns of different countries and, you know, warfare and things like that, looking at history. And here we have a person who has all of these, all of these documents sitting in boxes who then said the other day, I didn't have enough time <laughs> to return those things when every day golf, he's golfing every day. And to to play 18 holes, and of course he's got all these things. How can you make an excuse, I don't have any time, because all I know is to play 18 holes, right, no matter who you are, even if you're just playing by yourself with a golf cart, that's going to be like two hours of time. So all you had to do is take two hours of time on one day in the last, what, year, and say, uh, oh, accidentally I took these boxes, you know, sorry, you know, here they are, National Archives. So some of these excuses, but back to the whole thing of Greg Norman and so on, our media, right, has all of this anger and frustration and arguing about PGA and what's right and Saudi Arabia and oil and power and all that. And I don't hear anything about women, women golfers. It's all about the guy who's in charge of the PGA who said he was never going to do this, apparently, and then he caved or whatever it is. And so there's all this political stuff. But again, you know, I'm ready for to hear that all these fantastic women golfers, just like women in soccer have been fighting for years, the, the American women's, you know, league, right? They've been fighting to get the same pay as men in soccer, you know what I mean, okay. in America. Wait, uh, uh, to your point, uh, and, and, and this, is, this, this is dated because it happened in February, but apparently there's a woman named Megan McLaren, do you know of her? No, no, I don't. Okay, well, um, she um, explains why she's playing in Saudi Arabia, where the purse is one of the highest in women's golf. So mm -hmm. some of the women, apparently, uh, right. are taking the bold stance against playing in the first uh, professional uh, golf event, saying that competing in the kingdom didn't fit with their values. But this woman, who's an English woman, she right. said, oh, no, she said, I'm going to play because you guys don't pay, pay us much money. And uh, and the the three time winner on the ladies European tour is one of 120 players who will tee up in the Amico Saudi Ladies in the International, which features a five million dollar purse. So, well, you, yeah, you and, never and hear that in this country. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. And, you know, this reminds me, you know, this issue is Cancer and Capricorn, Sun and Cancer, Moon and Capricorn, full moon coming up July 3rd, within one day of America's solar return. And Cancer is the first water sign re representing, I was just using a quote to give to my daughter, Katya, who wants the upfront section from Alice A. Bailey, Esoteric Astrology, about the fact that the moon, which rules the sign Cancer, which, of course, of the two lights, the sun and the moon, is the feminine of the two. And according to Alice Bailey and her teacher, the Tibetan Master DK, and I've studied all this for 40 years before I went to Findhorn, and that's part of the whole meaning of GPS astrology, which is the idea of goodwill as love and action, as which is a theme from Lucis Trust and the Alice Bailey Center in New York City and around the world. And from Findhorn, all your needs will be met from Eileen Caddy and Peter Caddy from Scotland, but the, the keynote being, well, what are your needs? You know, it's one thing to say all your needs will be met, having faith and trust, you know, your life moving forward and so on. But it's important to understand what your needs are. And here you brought up about this woman. You know, if if in America and the West, right, women had been paid more equally, right, instead of having to be pulled and, you know, drag kicking and screaming where they go for years saying, can you, why can't we have the same amount of money? Same thing was happening with tennis, right? and golf, and soccer, and all of these areas, okay? And I don't know what's happening with the Women's National Basketball Association, but undoubtedly the same kind of thing of how much are we getting paid compared to the men, right? You know, and in films, this, is, this goes on too. All the male actors, you know, the Al Pacinos, right? They tend, unless, of course, there's always a small group of women, you know, actors, actresses, like the Jennifer Lawrences or whatever, who are stars, 
But most women still in the entertainment world get paid much less, you know, in terms of films and, and the entertainment world. And the, the reason I'm going to bring this up is this is not a chart that we're going to have now, but in October we're having an annual or solar eclipse, which is when the moon is a little too far from the Earth to completely cover the sun's disk. It happens on October 14th. We've already had two other eclipses in April and May. And that one will be on the United States Juno from July 4th, 1776 in Libra. Okay, this is an eclipse that goes actually from where I'm living in Eugene through Nevada, New Mexico, um, goes into, I think it hits San Antonio straight on, goes into uh, Mexico, Central America, and so on. So it's as powerful as a total solar eclipse, but there's a kind of ring effect. That's what's called annular. The reason I bring that up is it's going to be exactly on our Juno and opposite our Chiron. And the next topic will be on Chiron and what's ha- been happening with horses um, who have been kind of mysteriously dying, or maybe it's not mysterious, it's that they're being pushed, you know, the jockeys, and again, it's again a money thing, you know what I mean? We'll get that into a moment. So I'm really glad you brought up this woman, and the thing is, is that it's sad to me to think that someone would ally themselves, like, right, whether it's a woman golfer or a male golfer, and say, well, I don't care that Saudi Arabia is, look, what they did with Jamal Khashoggi, you know, killing him at the embassy, you know, uh, in Turkey, you know, where you have visited before and taught astrology, you know, in this embassy. And, you know, the leader of Saudi Arabia is sort of like, oh, we'll just sort of say, you know, we'll give you a pass, right? Now, I, again, I'm bringing up disparate things. But again, even back to 911, you know, were they lying to us then about this, the hijackers? You know, why did you know, George Bush Sr. and George Bush Jr. and Dick Cheney and Donald Trump. And the same thing with our current Democratic president and administration. Because Saudi Arabia is fighting against Iran and Iran has been our enemy, quote unquote, apparently, you know, for so many decades, we wind up supporting Saudi Arabia with all this money, the oil and the power. And I hate to use a term like this, but like our own balance of feminine, masculine, low energies of the country be damned, you know, because we're not giving women the same amount of money that we should give men in all these different sports, or at least something fairly close. Well, the 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 readily, readily available amount of money that has existed in the Gulf, disproportionate yeah. to the rest of the world and other societies, because the Saudis can afford that their citizens don't have have many many benefits, right? And and be very very privileged, and that they could import the majority of the labor to do their bidding, whether it be building cities or maintenance uh, communities. My daughter and her uh, her her baby boy went there. Uh, and stayed a month, and she said it was really incredible, you know, uh, what you see, and yeah. and and you can see easily see the distinctions between the people who have the money and who are Saudis and the people who are not Saudis and don't have the money. But beyond that, uh, for the last since the eighties, I've been studying uh, along with you. Um, the Persian Gulf because of its import in the world. You don't have to be an astrologer to see how important oil is in the world. You don't have to be an astrologer to see how important, uh, you know, all of the energy manipulations have been by governments, whether it be OPEC or whether it be, um, you know, the British Red Line Agreement or whether it be the United States, uh, because they certainly do play their role when mm-hmm. when they are doing their shell oil in America and competing against the fossil fuels that are coming out of the Persian Gulf. But, you know, it, it's not just that kind of power that's on display in the Gulf where we have our Pluto midheaven. It's mm-hmm. all kinds of power on display. And so mm-hmm. now we have the sport, sporting world power, yeah. where, whether it be soccer, and we yeah. saw at the last World Cup the the hold that that the 
the, the Gulf states have on world soccer. It was there mm-hmm. on display for everybody to see. And I find it, you know, I mean, people are like holding their nose so much these days that, you know, the nose must be bruised and pinched from all the holding because <laughs> you can't you can't turn the blind eye, you know, those phrases, turn a blind eye or mm-hmm. uh, look the other way or mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, tongue and cheek, you know, all of this stuff. We've done it and done it and done it and done it. And, you know, it's 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 exhausted. And so right. I don't see any, um, uh, there's no logic in doing it. People are doing it because they have the power to do it. And that's right. the end. And it's not like if 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 there's a wide, it's not like if there's a uh, a tumult, if, if the public uh, uh, reacts negatively to it, that it's going to have any impact on these people with all the power who are doing what they want anyway. Because uh, look at what happened to Khashoggi. I mean, yeah. and and everybody was outraged and nobody did anything. Well, yeah, let me bring up, and, and we're going to go on to, to talk about um, horses in a minute, which is yes. a big part of America, yes, Sagittarius Rising. And again, Sagittarius Rising in the U.S. Another part. sport. And another, another sport. sport. and Saturn. The sport of kings. <laughs> Kings, right, exactly. You know, the run for the roses, right? Con- you know, Kentucky Derby and things. So I want to bring that up. The, the one final point, thank you for everything you're sharing. I mean, or, by the way, again, this is happening under a moon-Jupiter polarity, which a lot of people might look at my cosmic calendar, which, again, one little pitch there, astrology cosmic calendar with a K that I've been doing for 42 years. It's our anniversary this month. So my daughter was born when it started with Welcome to Planet Earth back in 1981. The cosmic calendar began. And if you're not familiar with it, it's all the sky cycles, good, bad, up, down, all over the place, free one day at a time, or subscription into the future to become your own Nostradamus for pennies a day. Astrology, cosmic calendar with a K. So back to what I want to say about the woman golfer you brought up, right, in England, I believe. Yes. You asked yes. me the name and I didn't know. And she decided, well, I'm going against maybe my sisters in golf. You know, I'm going to take that money, right? Now, think about this part of it. Women as second-class citizens, and that is saying, I mean, we're not even talking reality here. How they are treated in Saudi Arabia, how they are treated in Iran, how they are treated in Afghanistan, you know, under the different kinds of, you know, rulership of, of Islam. And again, I, you know, I've studied some of this stuff, you know, both of us have, right? Where neither one of us is of that religion. But I do know that the whole clash, I mean, you and I have talked about something to remind people, Iran and Iraq for seven years when Saddam Hussein was in charge, you know, of, of uh, Iran, uh, Iraq, excuse me. And hundreds of thousands of people died in that war that nobody even talks about anymore, you know, way before Persian Gulf War One and Two. Why, you know, fighting against Iran. And the whole thing of uh, Sunni versus Shia goes back to 500 something, you know, with Mohammed and the beginning of the Islamic realm and the whole difference of this it's just like in the west we have catholicism and protestantism and i've I've studied that so fascinating and the anglican church in england you look in the almanac and if you look up christianity right you're going to find something like of the two billion or three billion so-called christians like half are catholic and the other half are protestant but in the protestant division are like hundreds of divisions hundreds you know, Baptist this, you know, Latter-day Saints that, and so on and so forth. My point in all this is that people were killing each other in Iran and Iraq in a seven-year war before we even got to these other horrific wars. And basically, it's that, you know, one country was believing that from 566, whatever it is, the handing over of Mohammed's Energy was either, and again, I, I don't want to mislead anybody because I'm not a scholar of Islam. Maybe you have the exact answer. But one was it went to the brother-in-law of somebody, of Mohammed versus it didn't go to the brother-in-law. So in other words, it was like who's in charge, who, who gets 
the power. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? After the leader of a religion dies. It's like a split. And so since 500-something, these forces within Islam have been clashing. And we talk about our crusades, so, you know, which went on for hundreds of years and which is still sort of happening between Christianity and Islam. And, the, you know, in the Islamic world, they're still fighting their own inner division and killing each other. You know what I mean? So, you know, again, then we have the whole thing in, in the sports world where this one particular English woman golfer is, like, sticking her neck out and saying, you know what? I need the money. If England, you know, and the, and the golfers in the West were giving me more money, I wouldn't have to do it. But I feel I need to do it. So she makes that move. But the people in Saudi Ar- me, the women in Saudi Arabia and in Iran, they don't have freedoms. They, you me, know, they're being restricted all over the place. Let me give you McLaren's uh, uh, quote uh, to tie this up neatly. She says, at the end of the day, money is power. We live in a world where that is the truth. And you can't get around that. How you choose to use that money will say a lot about who you are as a person. So these women have been hate mail. And, uh, for example, the three-time major winner, Anna Norquist, um, who was also sponsored, she said, it's just horrible the kind of – here's her quote. I wasn't really prepared to get such an incredible amount of hatred and mean comments from people who don't even know me. So the athletes themselves, just like I'm talking about Smelling and Lewis and and Jesse Owens uh, and and the sprinter and the jumper for the Nazis. I can't remember his name off the top. But, you know, these people are the pawns in this game that has to do not with the sport at all. It has to do with something very different. It's it's well, like uh, we move on yeah. to the next topic of, of horse racing. You know, these people are betting on these horses. Yeah, and, you yeah. Know, and frequently horses die because they are pushed to perform. Right. Well, you know, absolutely. And as a little kid, you know, growing up, I used to, you know, loving all sports, like yourself, you know, the question is like, whatever we've been active in, we all choose, like, we played a lot of stickball because in New York City, that was easier. The parks were like concrete parks, you know, and they were, you'd take a broom handle, you know, and this was like a particular New York City deal, you know, and you can see people, when Willie Mays was was um, joined the New York Giants, you know, before, before they moved to San Francisco, if you watch Say Hey Willie Mays, there's a little scene of him playing with the kids, right, like in, in Manhattan, you know, when the cars aren't going on the street and the kids come out with a broom handle and a little rubber ball and they all come out and they play stickball, you know what I mean? Because there's no nearby park and it doesn't cost anything. A broom handle is nothing. The rubber ball, you know, costs you a dime. And they have a game, right? They show Willie, you know, playing with the kids. So think about that. You know, and by the way, Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle, you know, coming up center field just for these New York teams, you know, they're making peanuts compared to the, you know, I mean, in those days, you know, they were getting the top salaries, and that was like eighty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars a year. By the way, I will give back that one more time. I think we we talked about this one point when Babe Ruth got a, he got what was it a salary? He was given I think it was nineteen twenty eight. It was after they won the Yankees won nineteen twenty seven World Series. They had what was called Murder's Row, Gehrig, Ruth, and all these amazing players. And they won. And so he was rewarded with a contract for the Yankees at that point. I'm laughing because it's like the funny thing about it. And it was like no one had ever earned anything because, you know, Babe Ruth changed everything. The house that Ruth built, you know, Sultan of Swat and all this stuff, the Roaring Twenties. And he was given a salary of 1929, 1933. Yeah, well, he was given a salary of like some the, the reporters come in and say, "Hey, babe, you you know you're getting like eighty thousand or whatever it is. You know, you're making more than the president of the United States." At that point, I think it was Hoover who had just come in. Hoover, it was right. Hoover. Yeah, yeah. And he Hoover. said, "I had a better year than he yes, did." Yes, he did. That was his yeah. clip. One of the great clips of all time. I mean, and they all laughed. 
There you go. Now, I mean, and this is an important thing. Look at the former President Trump saying, yeah, you know, golf, they're, you know, power, money, the Saudis. Who were their, his friends? Remember the sword dance? When he became president, he goes to yep. Saudi Arabia. That's the first place he yep. goes, and he's part of the – you can still see him dancing along yep. with Melania. Yeah. You know, and by the way, he's the same president who said – remember when um, Jeff – I want to say – the other governor of Florida, Jeff, who was running for president – you know, in Florida, who had the lead before Trump took it away from him, he said he had low energy. Remember that whole thing, that Jeb yeah. had low energy? Well, meanwhile, yeah. you know, this is the whole Bush family were the ones, let's not forget, they came from New England, went to Texas, established this Zapata oil, became all of these, you know, made all this money in Texas with oil. So it goes back to all of the stuff. It isn't just Donald Trump. No, it isn't only the bushes. It's right. the whole thing of what you brought up, which, by the way, was on the cover of our 1987 magazine. Brother Wayne did all this research with astro cartography based on the U.S. chart. Fundamentally, we have Pluto, which has just returned the first time ever overhead in the Persian Gulf, which explains our issues so terribly over the decades with Iran. And again, that's we, we've talked about it before. Brother Wayne, you can you can see his book about the war impulse pattern, by the way, in GPS astrology, um, just before uh, Brother Wayne's new article on all these issues that come out. So he's the expert on all this. But back to the horses, okay, and the Chiron energy. Yep. The reason I wanted to at least bring this up is yep. at Churchill Downs and these things, the reports kept coming in. And again, investigation of the owners of these horses not so much the jockeys, right, but no. the trainers and the owners and how yep. these horses are being pushed, the, 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 the medical stuff that's going on, right? Yes. The pharmaceutical industry, which is a, a whole other field, yes. you know. And what I was thinking is also in another way about the power of money. I'm thinking, you know, in our cars, right? So when we think of the horse and the history of the country, the cavalry, you know, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, all of the things about the meaning of horses, not just in our country, but around the world, and yeah. riding horses and the whole thing of the West and pioneering, discovery of Neptune, 1846, go West, young man, the pioneers, the horses, you know, I mean, just the whole thing. Look, Bonanza, 1960 on a Sunday night, right? <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? The, the, the horse, okay, and the, the three races, you know, sea biscuit, citation, whirl away, the betting, the, the betting, you know, the run for the roses. And now Chiron is returning. It's at 19 plus of Aries. It's going to exactly return. Chiron is in 1977. It's connected to the concept of the centaur, half human, half horse. In the U.S. chart, it's in, at 20, 20 plus of Aries opposite Arjuna. And that uh, annular eclipse on October 14th is igniting that. So more issues about healing, shamans, keys that open doors to higher consciousness. And I've been on the track with JFK and Chiron because when JFK was murdered in Dallas, November 22nd, 1963, which is going to have its 60th anniversary, unfortunately, Chiron was not moving. And you can Mark. read my article on page eight of the last issue. So Chiron has a lot to do with healing. And our own horses are being mistreated. Go ahead. Mark, the horses, one of the problems with the horses is they they will literally run themselves to death. Mm -hmm. But pain makes them stop. And a lot of the racetracks apparently yeah. are giving them painkillers. Uh -huh. So they go past that threshold. And when they so push past that, yeah. the thoroughbred has an X chromosome, which allows it, it has a heart that's twice as big as a normal horse, and right. it has a chromosome in it that allows it to do things internally that, that allow it to hit and sustain great amounts of speed. But, it, yeah. but basically, the thoroughbred horses are not capable of running at top speed for the whole race. They must set a pace. And you always hear when they're announcing a race, like at the right. Kentucky Derby, they're always using that word pace. 
And then they talk about finishing and how a horse might stay, you know, in the back or maybe in the middle of the pack. And then all of a sudden the jockey and with his skill will get the horse to respond for that last minute burst towards the finish line. He said um, a bunch of these horses uh, sustained injuries because they couldn't feel the pain of the stress of the running that they were doing. And that I think is one of the major concerns and it's one of the things that can't be easily policed at, at the racetracks. So By you know, way, when, no, go ahead. So when these when these owners come in there, and you know, it's it's, it's big time owners who have been losing horses. I As just they, looked up. Yeah. Well, let me just throw something out because you mentioned about the, the heart of the horse. So as a kid, you know, loving all these sports, well, we, the Belmont was the last one. That was in New York State. Yeah. Um, the Kentucky Derby starts the whole thing. Yeah. I believe. Or, or the, we have the Preakness, which is in Maryland. Okay, you got the Kentucky Derby. You know, you got – and the, the Belmont is the last one. And I just remembered from watching um, these different movies, particularly Sea Biscuit and all that, Secretariat, I remember when – he, I, I have the numbers. It's just amazing. I've never looked at the chart. I'm not looking at it now. But he, Secretary was born March 30th of 1970. He lived to be 19 and a half years old, uh, October 4th of 1989. Wow. Okay. Uh, Neptune crossing. the. By the way, that's within one month of the Ber, Berlin Wall falling. Talk about a Neptune, you know, uh, what do you call it, just to bring up something else. You know, 1970, March 30th, is about a month before Kent State. You brought up Sammy Davis. This is just on the fly, folks. I just took uh, – I'm looking at pictures of Secretariat because I remembered they looked at his heart, and they found his heart was twice as big as a normal heart. You know, I, I, I believe that's the story. And now he did – he had a record-breaking – he was called Big Red, and they have all these pictures. They agreed about this. March 30th, 1970, he's born. He dies October 4th, 1989. So when you think of a horse, right, and how magnificent that horse was and winning, um, let's say, I'm just reading, he is considered by many to be the greatest race horse of all time. He became the first triple crown winner in 25 years and his record-breaking victory in the Belmont Stakes, which I just brought up here, which he won by 31 lanes, 31 horse lanes. Isn't that He's amazing? widely regarded as one of the greatest races in history. Remember when Tiger Woods won the Masters when he was like 21? Yeah. And nobody, it was like an amazing score. And he had been on Johnny Carson, you know, his father. Right. Was, like, he right. was on Johnny Carson like at age five, you know. Like, yeah. Johnny is like, oh, my God, this kid is going to be amazing. And he has been, and, except that he got into a terrible car crash. Speaking of. I, I was thinking about how we still use the term horsepower in yes. cars. Yes. You know, yes. how much horsepower because the, the the car and Ford and all these companies with all their zillions of dollars replacing the carriage, the Pony Express, right? A, 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 a men and women on horses, right? Wait, 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 wait for it, Mark. You can't have uh, a Kentucky Derby winning champ, but you can have a Ford Mustang. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, see, again, the, these you, know, you just reminded me of something because I think I might have mentioned this another time, and we, we are nearing the end here, folks, but we've got a couple more minutes, so, you know, we'll, we'll give we'll five or ten minutes to just sort of bring our thoughts together here because this is, you know, it's really great to be sharing. We haven't done a whole lot of it recently for various reasons. But what I was going to say is when I was living in Massachusetts and before Katja, my second daughter, was born, Gab, Gabriella, the eldest, was in the car with me in back seat, and we were living near um, the community of Gordon and Corrine, which is down the road, they created, and this is interesting because of the cover of GPS Astrology, we have the Great Bear, the Seven Stars, Seven Stars of Pleiades, and Sirius, the Dog Star, which is actually a double star system, just so you know. There's a, a white dwarf, even though Sirius is the brightest star in the sky, it's a blue-white, an incredibly powerful star. 
uh, it has a companion. We'll do that another time. But the reason I'm bringing this up is I was driving, I forget the car we had, and my daughter, who's in the car seat, was in the back of the car, and we're driving on dirt air, a road that's just outside of Amherst, Massachusetts, and a car from the community, we knew these people on a dirt road, hit my car in a little, you know, just slightly. It wasn't a terrible accident, but it could have been, right? And I noticed, being an astrologer at that point, this was 1980, approximately, and my daughter was only one. And I'd been into astrology for eight years. So guess what, Brother Wayne? I get out you know, the car. I knew the gal. She was apologetic. I'm so sorry. You know, we're changing, you know, exchanging licenses, you know, like about depending on damage, you know, it wasn't a whole lot. And I noticed, you just wrote up the, the Mustang, the car was a Mercury Comet, right? And I actually went and went back and looked at the astrology, and I don't know, I think it was either Mercury was rising in the sky or above. Right. Mercury, the planet in the heavens, was prominent, and the car was Mercury comet that hit us by accident. Right. No accident. So like, you know, be careful about the names of these things. That's again, right. It's, it's, you know, again, this is part, like, what, I'm so glad you brought up about saying if, if they're giving these horses, which I think is the big scandal, these painkillers, then the horse, you know, doesn't know that it's their, their, you know, paw, you know, their different parts of their body and they're being pushed by the jockeys with all this money on the line. And then they've had to kill these several horses and it's become a big scandal in the whole world of racing and, and for, you know, the well-being of horses, you know, PETA and all these different organizations, like where are you people and where is, where is, where is the governance of these different tournaments, you know, that you allow this to happen? Well, Mark, they say that um, at the Belmont Stakes and at the, you know, during the Triple Crown, you know, the deaths of dozens, dozens of thoroughbreds at Santa Anita Park in Southern California, uh, mm -hmm. the chemical horses, they call them. And they say there's a, you know, they came out with a new um, people for the ethical treatment of animals, P-E-T-A, PETA. And they they worked up these laws that are on the books, but yeah. apparently um, there are 30 approved therapeutic medications, including sedatives, painkillers, muscle relaxants, and nearly all horses that race today take the two most popular substances, and one of them is called Laxit Six Laxix to combat yeah. bleeding. Bleeding <laughs> and oh, pain God. relief, anti-inflammatory. Um, oh boy! Oh, butte. So they, they, all of these horses are loaded up with painkillers and things that prevent them from bleeding to death while they're racing. Well, well, well. Here's the other thing that's amazing because you brought up, you started this, Sammy Davis Jr. racing Nixon, which I think was for his re-election, which would have been around '72, if I'm remembering correctly. The Triple Crown was won by Secretariat in 1973, which is one Chiron cycle ago, right? That's when Watergate began. Actually, Watergate began in June of 72. And then McGovern lost to Nixon, even though he's saying, hey, you've got to investigate this whole thing of the, the break-in, you know? So they went through a whole year. In 73 and 74, when Nixon finally resigned and Ford took over, you know, who had been vice president, that's when Chiron came back. The wounded healer, the, the centaur, the shaman, yep. keys yep. opening doors. This is not money. Chiron in mythology as a son of Saturn, and I believe it was Rhea, or he was an immortal, but he was wounded in a labor of Hercules with a poisoned yeah. arrow. Now, this yeah. is interesting because what is happening to these horses? They're being poisoned with these chemicals, with painkillers, yep. and then they're, they're, they're basically, they're being forced to commit suicide. I mean, they're being pushed beyond. And it's interesting that the United States has, I, I've said this to many, you know, put it out to the world. We'll, we'll make this final comment for me, and you can make yours, and then we'll be done for this time. We'll move on to the next one. The U.S. chart is very interesting, and we could go on for hours about this because, and you do this much more than I do or anybody that I know, 
you look at it also like what was happening? What did we know? What planets existed in 1776? There was no Uranus, you know, for five years, four or five years. There was no Neptune until 1846. There's no Pluto. Do you, when I look at Juno opposite Chiron, which is the closest alignment in addition to, say, Ceres squaring Uranus, I'm talking about planets that didn't exist. Washington and Jefferson and all these different people, founding fathers and mothers, you know, they were into astrology in different ways and into esoterics and different kinds of things, right? Uh, Knights Templar and all these different, you know, th different histories that are really fascinating, you know, if one looks into them esoterically and spiritually. And the destiny of America, you know, at that particular point. But they didn't know where all the planets were, okay? And it strikes me that Chiron, you know what I mean, opposite Juno, okay, very close from 20 plus of Libra to 20 plus of Aries. And look at what's happening now with Trump versus Biden and, you know, whether they're going to be run in their 80s. Talk about people who are beyond what we would normally call, at least for me. I'm not satisfied with any person who's 80 years old, you know, running the country. That's just my personal opinion. I don't care left, right, up, down, you know what I mean? It doesn't make me feel confident. I can't change anything if that's the way it's going to be next year. But we are going to have, by the way, on April 8th of 2024, that total solar eclipse, is going to be exactly, and you know this as well, exactly conjunct Chiron in the sky. Three times next year during a presidential year, we're going to have Chiron returns. And we're already having a close one right now, okay, but it's not going to be precise. It's going to fall short. Venus and Chiron actually both go retrograde, station go retrograde, on July 22nd, 23rd. For those of you who are listening, Venus goes retrograde for six weeks in Leo, and Chiron goes retrograde till like about December for five months. All the outer planets always go retrograde for about five months. Saturn, Chiron, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, Sedna, Eris, all these other ones, Quayor, you know, they're all going retrograde for almost half the year, and nobody particularly squawks about that. It's the Mercury retrogrades that they do squawk about. But at any rate, Chiron is a big deal. What, what we're talking about to all of you, keep your Keep your mind on what's happening with the horses in America and this whole scandal, because I think it's going to get even more extreme over the next year as America has its Chiron return. Okay, Mark. Closing let thoughts from you. Yes. Let me tie it to one thing. We in this country, and I don't know if it's a worldwide thing, but certainly it, it happened in America. We had an opioid crisis. And my understanding, I don't know if, if I ever used an opioid, I don't know if I ever did during my yeah. life, but it's my understanding that people who are in extreme pain or go through serious operations or like athletes, like I know a lot of football players were using opioids because of pain and then they got addicted. So I don't know if that's the major reason it is prescribed to Americans. But mm -hmm. I'm going to with this quote, and it's a recent quote uh, from 2021, and it's from the Jamaican um, Observer, and they say that painkillers are the most common illegal substances used in race horse racing. And the, med mm -hmm. the medications that impact the muscular, respiratory, cardiovascular, and nervous system are often detected. And mm -hmm. so why are they giving horses pain? They want them to run faster. And yeah. why do they want them to run faster? They want them to win or place. And why is that important? Because it's gambling. It's betting. And yeah. so, you know, there there is an inducement for people to drug their animals. You know, um, one quick other comment. I did, with Welcome to Planet Earth, which we were both part of, you know, for 20 years on mundane or Earth astrology, great astrologers. That's how Brother Wayne and I first got to know each other. We, on the side, part of the reason we created Out of Bounds, two guys talking sports and astrology, is we were doing this, as if you remember the first one or two that we did, folks out there, we were doing this like dozens of times during the COVID thing. And it was like, suddenly it's like, hey, you know, this should be a podcast. We came up with the name and now it's actually happening. One of the things that is really fascinating because you brought up about betting again, 
what I found out when the beginning of the country with the with the 13 states, you know, and revolting against the, the King George the Third, in order to fa- to finance right our colonial fighters against the redcoats, a lot of what we had to do were lotteries, okay, or basically, you know, people were all putting money together, right, and somebody would win, you know, like 20 bucks or whatever it is, $10, and they would all get together. This was kind of like fundraising to clothe the soldiers and all these different things. Anyway, it, there's a whole history there of, like, put pooling money, you see what I mean? The same thing of what now is this exaggerated thing of betting that is destroying all these big sports. While while Pete Rose, you know, who apparently, maybe he lied, but basically he gambled, you know, for years he said he didn't do it at all. But fundamentally, both playing for Cincinnati Reds and managing them, he wound up betting. And of course, because of the Black Sox scandal, He's been ostracized, you know. But the thing that strikes me is, again, I, I go back to Pete Rose, who's born, by the way, on the day of a Pluto station. We talk about Pluto, you know, overhead in the Persian Gulf of the USA with astrocartography. Brother Wayne's amazing work with that. And the fact that Pluto has come back for the first time in 247 years. That's what you're bringing up, too, because Pluto, the god of the underworld and mysteries and secrets and things that are pushed down below, you know, the musks of the world, Trump, all these people with billions of dollars, the Saudis, all of this thing is money. Whether it's baseball, right? Golf and horses, you know what I mean, that we're talking about today. Money is ruling these things. And it's a shocking kind of thing when innocently, you know, when we were fighting against the British, it's like, well, you know, let's all gather together in a small group. And maybe we can, you know, give out some kind of like re- if everybody puts in five or ten dollars, right? And we can have a community mail or something. Somebody wins like Betsy Ross's flag or something. You know what I mean? We'll give a prize out, right? But let's get together as a community to support these soldiers who are going to fight what will eventually be the victory, right? Against England. You know what I'm saying? So there is. A, I wrote about this in these two stories about like the roots of gambling in America. And it goes back to these different kind of lotteries and fundraising things that took place in the 13 colonies, you know, very innocently, right? Churches, you know, neighbors, you know, let's all get together and do stuff together. And maybe somebody will get, you know, an extra dessert, you know, tonight or something at the campfire, right? And that, was, way of and that was as democratic a behavior as you could possibly imagine that collectively right. people would support a cause. What we're right. talking about in this modern era is the Elon Musk of the world, the people right. with all the money and deep right. pockets, and they're not persuaded by religion or morality or any other right. thing. They can do yeah. what they want and right. essentially get away with it. I mean, they know how to work the system. They can control the courts. They they never end up getting the uh, you know the justice <laughs> delayed, yeah. justice denied. We're not with these guys where it happened 10 years ago and, and, and they're still in the courts litigating well, the issue. Well, you're so right on. I want to mention two more other people because they were athletes, both from baseball, since we started with that. I don't, I never liked Pete Rose, okay, Charlie Hustle. We talked about him either last or whatever it is. But I can still remember, okay, when he passed Ty Cobb, okay, because I get chills now. The guy got 4,000 hits. I don't care how much he gambled, how much money, which was his money, right? Now, of course, he went against the baseball rules when they found out later, and he did lie about it. Wait, he wait, can't be in the hall. Wait, 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 wait. He can't Mark, be in the hall. Baseball the rules. Got- baseball well, rules that changed. <laughs> right. That they're changed. changing now. They're changing the rules, but they won't honor a guy who – you talked about the singles that are not happening. The guy got more singles than everybody. He was not a home run hitter. He was a singles guy, a doubles guy. He was a switch hitter like Mickey Mantle, for God's sake. That's not easy to do. And he got over 4,000 hits. People go to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Little kids, where's Pete Rose? Oh, well, he's not there. And you look at Babe Ruth carousing and some of the Ty Cobbs and other people who were all in the hall from the very beginning. Well, they're larger than life. 
You know, they yeah. were they, they're the founding fathers of baseball, the national yeah. pastime. And one other thing, you brought up San Francisco, and I'm a New York Yankee fan, but because of family and going many times to the different, you know, to San Francisco, Candlestick a little bit, but then, you know, giant, uh, the San Francisco Giant Stadium, which another little pet peeve of mine is what do we have left where you have the name of a stadium? Wrigley Park in Chicago, Fenway Park in Boston, Yankee Stadium, Dodger Stadium, and there's like 28 other teams, and it's all – AT and T Park, Safeco <laughs> Stadium. Again, can't look. Here's the thing: make a deal. Okay, you're the owner. You can't have Safe Safeco Giant Stadium. You can't have the word Giant still there. That's they won't even allow that. It's like, and, and I know it's not AT and T Park. It's whatever the name is, and the same thing in Seattle and in San Diego and in Pittsburgh and everywhere else. It's like signing up with the devil. We're going to get all this money, right, from Coca-Cola or whoever it's going to be, right? The right. The of the world or whatever it is. But by the right. way, in the fine print, you could not use the word giant. You could not put Padres on your thing. And if right. you do, we'll sue the hell out of you because we right. are the company. Now, yeah. the last thought is Barry Bonds because I just want to say this. You know, you know Barry Bonds was hated. In every single park, maybe not Pittsburgh, because he came from Pittsburgh to play with the, the Giants. And the whole, and by the way, say hey, Willie Mays, you see a lot of Barry Bonds. And when I went, and it was, Barry Bonds was hitting those home runs, make this one more final comment. And I loved, I didn't go to a lot of Yankee games. I watched a lot on TV, but I did see my hero, Mickey Mail. Others, one, one time he had a home, well, two times he had a home run. One, one was his most famous home run in a World Series. But when I, I'd never experienced, and no matter, people didn't do this at Yankee Stadium, Mickey Mantle was up. They'd be, you know, cheering, right? Applause, Mickey, you know. When Barry Bonds would come up during that home run stretch, when, when the pitchers were afraid to pitch him, everybody stood up, every pitch, every at bat, okay, regardless of, again, drugs and these other issues, you'd still have to hit the ball doesn't matter how much you bulked up or exactly what you took or how you took it. You have to hit the ball, right? It, you know, and, and Babe Ruth struck out. That was the whole thing of watching him. It was like, is he going to hit a homer or is he going to strike out? You know what I mean? Yeah, he and only had a 34 average when he was getting <laughs> $52,000 a year. <laughs> well, you know, Babe Ruth, his lifetime average is like way up. He's, he has a – this is from Mark Lerner, Almanac Rain. Look it up. It's like 342, lifetime average. And one of the things that Mickey Mantle was so upset about was he retired and his batting average was 298. Again, Ted Williams is the last player in 1941 when Joe DiMaggio had his streak. Ted Williams, and he decided to play the last day in a doubleheader. He was already over 400. And people were saying, just, you know, don't play so that you can be the first player since 1924, or, you know, one of these great, um, shortstops, you mentioned shortstop for the St. Louis Cardinals. These Some of these players were, were batting 400, you know, in the 1920s. And Ted Williams decided to play in a doubleheader and got like six for eight and raised his batting average from like 401 to 407. Last time somebody hit 400, which means six out of 10 times you make an out. And the normal thing is if you're a 300 hitter, Seven of ten times you're making it out, and that's yeah. considered great. Well, anyway, yeah. my final thing is Barry Bonds, it was, like, amazing. It was magnetic. It was electric, electric, but it was only in San Francisco, you see. And he was beloved, totally beloved, like Willie Mays, you know, and Willie McCovey and some of these people. And, again, I'm just saying you've got all of you wherever you're living, whether it's baseball, it's golf, it's horse racing, it's football, basketball. You have your heroes and your heroines. And what we're saying is, you know, and I guess that's the theme here. Money makes the world go round, supposedly, but it's certainly money not makes the world go round. It's ma- making the world go round a little bit, although we know that that's not actually it. It's the earth spinning, and it's, it's the brothers and sisters in the in the cosmos, and the sun and the moon and the solar system. Wait, and all wait, these wait. Here, here, here's here's a clarification. Money makes the human world go round. There you go. Yeah. 
and there's other ways in which humanity can shift gears. And I, I so appreciate our doing this today. Thank you for everything you're sharing and what I'm sharing. We'll be back hopefully more frequently, um, both on uh, YouTube and, again, on uh, Great Parent Prizes. This is also going to appear in our Astroscope section of podcasts. So fundamentally, we've got Astroscope at Great Parent Prizes. This is going to be in GPS Astrology, issue number five, coming out July 3rd, and on YouTube. So kind of three places for what we're sharing today. So love and blessings to you, Brother Wayne, and to everybody listening. Do you want to say something at the end? You have a, a lot of something that you'd like to share that I think you shared before to close out. Yeah, down. folks, uh, find your place, seize the time, and live your life as art. And get yourself a cosmic calendar. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Brother Wayne. And we'll be back the next time with another Out of Bounds, Two Guys Talking Sports and Astrology. Bye for now. Goodbye. Bye-bye.